fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Los Angeles. One hundred two point three FM Riverside. And one hundred five oh AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren, and we've got Mr. Dave Martino playing hockey. Hockey? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was playing baseball. No, it's always hockey. baseball. Yeah, hockey. You're, okay, you're yeah, you're no good. At, come on. Yeah, so that's get true. into the. No, hockey. No. Hockey. It's, it's okay. winter. You got to be skating. Oh well, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Come yeah. On. Get, get into it. I, I am. You know. So did you? Uh, <laughs> so I know you were away at Thanksgiving. I guess you. Um, you were the one. Someone bought that uh, original Superman cape. No, I didn't hear about that. Two hundred thousand dollars. Oh. Is that is that from the fifties? Uh, yeah, the George Superman? Reeves. Yeah, okay. the guy that got yeah. shot. Remember the shot yeah. Superman? Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if it still had the bullet hole in it, but oh, <laughs> well, he, he was wearing the cape. No, but I just thought I'd add that in there and get someone upset at me, you know. And say, oh, how can you leave? Um, yeah. So, but I just can't. Well, anybody two hundred? Could you imagine two hundred grand to? <laughs> To buy a cape that some no. guy wore in the 40s and 50s on a TV show that was Superman, a kiddie show. I just don't get it. I don't get it. I need a cape. I'm going to the Halloween <laughs> store or the dollar store, right? Yeah. I I don't know. It's a little crazy. Yeah, it's a little crazy. It seems like a lot of money that you could do a lot of things with. with and, yeah. You know, and I don't know. I'm just Big at fans. a loss. So, and of course, we're going to be continuing talking about the 50 biggest blunders according in rock and roll, according to the Rolling Stone magazine. Oh, that's right. And we talked about number 10 last time. So here, you, you know what number 14 was? I do not. The Monkees. The Monkees? The Monkees. Like the Monkees themselves. Yeah, the band. <laughs> <laughs> not, not the ones out in the jungle. And, yeah. and anyway, the Monkees... Uh, attempted to make their own album and movie um, with all their own writing rather than oh. anybody else. Because at the time, they were famous that. in doing that. Everybody was on their case because, oh, well, you don't write anything. You know, it's, it's typical stuff you get. And so they said they were going to do everything, and it was a big flop, and that was the end of their career. Yeah. There you go. Big mistake. Where are they now? <laughs> Well, there's only one left. Well, that's what I mean, you see? <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault. But, but they had resurgences. Yeah, of yeah. course. They stuck around. They did. I saw them recently. And? That was great. Oh, yeah, you, you saw the, yeah. that, that guy, his last one, before he yeah. saw you yeah. and he kicked off. Yeah, Michael. <laughs> yeah. You go, you <laughs> Michael Nismith. He saw you stand there and scream, and he thought that... that, that What's my life become? Yeah, you know, that's it. This is you my pulled off the stage. This is my you know fan. Yeah. yeah, I have that effect on people. Yeah, yeah. and then he went yeah. back to, and he died. <laughs> Man, you you are just something terrible, terrible, a terrible person. Anyway, well, speaking of death, <laughs> we, we've got this fine lady from New York today um, coming to tell us about uh, murder. And it's um, murder in third position, and it's an on-point mystery. So third position is that like, um, um, oh, I won't. I'll get too many, too much bad mail for that one. But anyway, so we'll find out. So uh, Laurie Robbins, uh, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm really excited about being here. How did you? How did you get into writing? This is book three. 
of, of, of a mystery series. So um, somewhere down the road here, you decided that you wanted to write this mystery series and get it out there. What, what was it that um, happened that made you want to do that? Yes. Well, I had another series. Um, those were the master class mystery series, actually, and they take place in a suburban high school. And they're actually going to be republished by Level Best Books. Uh, the publisher that I had sadly went out of business with a lot of mergers going on. And, uh, they had the rights to my character. And while I was waiting to get it back, I just decided to write a whole different book, and in some ways, it is based on my own experiences. I'm a former dancer myself, and the world of dance, of ballet, the performing arts, New York City, it's just an inherently such a dramatic setting that I thought to myself, I, I could do something with this. And so there are five positions in ballet, in case you are interested, <laughs> yeah. although I under contract for six books, but we'll figure the sixth, the title of the sixth one out when we get there. So that was really the genesis of this particular um, crime fiction series. I will tell you kind of an interesting story about this latest book. It, it was inspired by two true crime events. And one of them was not a crime, but it was a stage set at the Metropolitan Opera for um, for a Wagner opera, and PBS did a whole documentary series on it because it was so dangerous. And there were several injuries, and I thought, well, I could do something with that. And for a ballerina, yes, that would be an interesting, suspenseful way to um, position to put her in. And the other one, which was more the genesis for the beginning of the series, even though I'm not sure I realized it myself when I began, was, again, was a real-life murder, again, at the Metropolitan Opera House at Lincoln Center. And uh, sadly, um, a musician, a violinist, was murdered. And I was at that performance. So, I know. But... Um, Why did you kill him? <laughs> <laughs> I know people ask me that all the time, and I think to myself, how often during the day do you think to yourself, if I could meet out justice? And so that's what happens in my books. That's good. I, I agree with That's great. Because, it, it, you know, I, I was talking, we were having uh, some crime authors, like true crime ones, and we were talking about that and justice and all that. And, and I was saying, I, I don't really believe that there is it's uh, justice is an illusion you know if someone someone kills someone and or mass shoots a big pile of people and they get caught and put in jail and go through trial and stuff i mean how is that really justice you know i really think that that is the reason why crime fiction is so popular because i feel at some level we deliver what real life can't do there is a level of, uh, it kind of begins in chaos and, and it ends in some kind of order. But we know that's not the case in real life. It's a lot messier than that, but um, it's not quite that messy in my books. Things are. Yeah, you know, rich lawyers and it takes forever and they get 10 years and they've killed someone or something. It's just, yeah, things like that happen too often to feel justice i don't know that's kind of a anyway anyway i don't want to run on that i'll be i'll have a stroke by the end well, let's avoid that and move on to fiction yes yeah, <laughs> well but you know um of all the different um let's say professions and jobs and uh careers that are out there in the world and have been for years different all all sorts of things you know i can think of police firemen i can think of working at McDonald's, uh, being a makeup artist, being there's all these different careers you could choose and all these jobs and stuff like that. Um, is the ballerina, is it like a dangerous one? Would it be up there with firefighting? No, it isn't dangerous in that a firefighter, 
police officer, these people are putting themselves in a dangerous situation. That's the nature of their job. But being a ballerina um, has its own perils, if you will. My, the protagonist of my stories is kind of the opposite of what you would expect. She's not an ingenue who's waiting for her big break. In fact, she makes jokes about 42nd Street all the time. She's on the other side of 30. She's had two knee operations. She's been very successful in her career, but that, those careers are very short. And she will, as she says about another dancer, she will retire with a high school, an online high school degree and an eating disorder when she joins the unemployment line. And so the perils of a life in dance aren't in life threatening unless you're storing in one of my books, in which case you will be facing some significant danger. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> unless, unless they knew Lori, then. <laughs> unless you're in one of my books, you're not facing that kind of danger, but there is, there is a lot of competition. There is a lot of pressure. There, you, you have to be perfect. And the, the need to be perfect is, the kind of pressure that I'm not sure too many people face on a daily basis. She can never not be great. And when life, aside from the occasional dead body, throws her these kinds of challenges, if you walk in and find out that a younger dancer all of a sudden has your role, or they've called in a guest artist and you have to fight for your place all over again, those are the kinds of perils, if you will, that um, that dancers do face, even successful ones. And so on that level, yes. Yeah, yeah I would imagine the, the stress, the intensity, the pressure, and um, not only to be perfect in your craft and the work, but also in the world. And then again, like you said, uh, it's, it's, it's so fleeting. It, it's just for the moment. Uh, youth goes so quickly and and so you've got to hit it you know um that that i imagine the pressure would be pretty intense that's sort of why you know i jokingly but i was still sort of curious if there was a lot of uh you know um nancy kerrigan things going on <laughs> do you remember that absolutely <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> apropos for a murder mystery or a crime fiction writer, there isn't that. I mean, on the one I say in my first book, something like, if you know anything about dance, you'll understand that this is a work of fiction. So even though all of the emotions are very real, the story is 100% fiction. My best friends today are aside from my writer friends, are all of the dancers I know. And we all still dance, and we all still support each other. So it, you do become a very tight-knit group within the company, but there is always going to be competition. So then you get in, and then you have to advance. If you don't advance after a certain period of time, you're let go, or you leave of your own accord. So the pressures really don't let up, and you're lucky to have good and loyal friends. I think that's true anywhere, but there is that added edge of competition. Right. Just there's just no getting around that part of it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, let let's let me try to understand the premise because this is a series. Um, how how do you have this going? Is this uh, do you do you have an actual uh, amateur sleuth that's the same in each book, or is each one totally its own story that just happened to be dealing with um, a ballet uh, murder? Yes, it, she is an amateur sleuth. Leah is my protagonist, and as things happen in these series she will come across one dead body after another however in the book that i am writing now she has a somewhat fraught or complicated romance of course with a homicide detective which is how she's going to move forward 
So, um, so they'll be working together. In each book, I try and add a different layer to it. So in Murder in Third Position, the one that just came out, I bring someone in from another world. So I don't want to, keep, I don't want to kill dancers. Um, and I'm not sure I killed too many of them. Definitely one. Oh, absolutely. One I know one of. <laughs> and a few others. They may have met an early demise. But uh, in the latest book, it's an artist who comes in. And he is the one who dies. And that, for me, was very interesting because you have the world of art and film and dance. And all of them are very competitive fields. And that was a very, kind of a very rich um, feel to mine for me. In my newest book, which is not quite finished, it is her detective friend who brings her in. She's actually going to be on Broadway because there are threats um, against someone else. So that's probably how we're going to be moving forward from there. And I guess once she has to retire as a dancer, she'll be hanging out her shingle and fighting crime up and down Broadway and into um, the depths of Lincoln Center. Well, you mentioned competition, and you were talking about pressure. Do, do you think that um, the perfectionism of uh, dancing follows you into your novel writing? Without a doubt, yes. I think, well, first of all, your book in your own, I can't read my book now. Because I'll, I'll find things that I don't like about it. I Once the book is, um, once I send in my last round of corrections, edits, I will not look at that book again. It would kill me to find a mistake. <laughs> and I know they're there. As you can tell, I'm trying not to be bitter. <laughs> but I think the really more important thing is this, that there is such a work ethic, and you are so, you're, there's no one driving you but yourself. Once you're in a company, the choreographer, the teachers, your coaches, everyone is going to push you. But in the end, it's, it's, if you're not completely self-motivated, then you're not going to make it. And so I have found in everything that I've done since I've been a dancer that that kind of work ethic isn't something that I think about. But since you've asked me, I'm going to say, yes, it has followed me. Very much so. Before we get into some of the details, what, what makes you write this kind of story where there's murder involved in a career that you really loved? Oh, well, there were so many people I wanted to kill. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so there, there's that end of it. I actually, like I say, there is so much inherent drama in that. I sometimes feel guilty like I, I should not be trashing the art form and the people whom I love. So there is that end of it. I suppose on some level kind of cliche that I'm writing what I know. And the fictionalized ballet or professional dance stories or movies that I've seen, they veer so far from the reality. There are so many things they get wrong. And I think one of my favorite things that... Um, one of my readers told me was how accurate my book was. That the details of daily life and just the in, her, the interior monologue, the insecurities, the triumphs, all of that. But it was so it was so accurate. It was so true to life. And I wanted to do that. I think it's it's always interesting to me when I read a book about some field that I know absolutely nothing about, and yet you, and then when you come away from the book, well, maybe I know a whole lot more about um, what it means to be a, a police officer in Victorian London. So all of those little details are fascinating to me, and I, I wanted to use my own expertise to illuminate the story. Do you still need to take liberties with... Um your characters and maybe, um, you know, the dance scene in, in creating your stories? I do. I definitely do. And one of the things that I've skirted in terms of total accuracy is um, that, that I go into a little bit more in my next book has to do just with very mundane things like 
uh, union, you know, the union of, you know, the stage workers. And so there were a couple of little um, details like that. I did take some liberties with that. Uh, even with her life there, again, there were a few things where I might have shaded something or other, but most of the details are pretty true. And, you know, even the fact that, and I will tell you this, it really does hurt so much more to go downstairs than upstairs. And I have to remind myself not to put that into all the time because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> those kinds of just really things like that, what it feels like to come back from an injury, what your interactions are with the people around you. Those are, for the most part, they are, they are, they are true. I don't think there's much, if anything, that, um, that anyone in the industry would cry foul, other than the murder. <laughs> well, too bad. <laughs> uh, so where do you, where, who do you associate yourself best with? Which character, um, do you find is mostly you or, or you're putting a lot of yourself into? I would say I put a lot of my fears into my main character. She isn't who I am, but we share a lot of the same fears. And I think I did that just because, again, writing what you know, what scares you the most? So I give her a lot of things I'm afraid of. But I don't know, a ton of things. I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid rodents of any kind. Um, I don't like things that have more legs than I do. <laughs> I don't like people to see my feet. They're very unattractive. Um, so I've given her a lot of my fears, but that's about it. Everyone else is someone I have invented from pieces of people I know, experiences that I've had. There might be one person, there might be one person who's based a little bit more on a real person, and that is a ballet coach, a teacher. And a few people have asked me uh, if it was based on a particular person. So she probably, she's just, she's every fantastic teacher we've ever had. But for me, I don't put myself that much into um, my characters. When you're putting together the story of, of the murder and that, um, the, these characters that you're playing with, all the, the extra characters and the, and the murder and all this stuff like that, um, how do you actually experience them? You know, are they, are they um, in your mind? Do you hear voices? Do you see movies? Like what... Um, what's what's your process when you're when you're working out the scenes? Wow, that is a really great question, which I think is what people say when they need another minute or two to think about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> got it. I really, even though I am a crime fiction writer, and obviously plot is really important. I actually start with the characters. And if I even to circle back to one of the questions you asked me earlier, it is the characters who come to me first. And I, I get this just, I don't know where it comes from, but I just get this whole sense of what they look like, um, what they wear, how they speak, so that the characters all have a slightly different way of framing their thoughts. So I really start with the characters, and I would say the characters drive the story more than the other way around. Do they talk to me? Yes. Sometimes I want them to shut up and <laughs> let me be. They talk to me. Uh, I wake up in the middle of the night, and I think, oh, Leah should do this. Or I, I have to rewrite that. That doesn't really feel right for her. Yes, they talk to me, and I love dialogue. And I am that person who is sitting next to you at dinner, listening in and trying to hear what's going on. Um, I'm the person sitting on the subway who does not have AirPods in because I am listening to the people who are around me. Uh, it, it is all about language for me, the characters and how they speak, and that drives 
pretty much everything else I'm going to say. Well, do your characters ever take over the plot at times, or do you have uh, the ability to kind of rein them in as you're writing? I just have to say that in two books so far, I had fixed upon the person who was the killer, and it turned out not to be him. And all I could think of afterwards was, this guy was so smart, fooled even me. And but then when I went back into the book, I realized that I had somehow set the clues for someone else all the way along. And I it almost did not need rewriting. It wasn't until three quarters of the way through that it needed anything different. So I'm going to say yes, that the characters will, not all the time, um, a lot of times I'm in charge, but every once in a while they do go off on their own and um, and surprise me. But I also have, sorry, I also have character. I have characters that come back, you know, book after book, and I do like to give them the room to grow and change. So they're not the same. Uh, some elements of them are the same, but I like to give them a little room to um, to change. Well, I was just going to ask, so you say sometimes you're not in charge. So when you're not in charge and these voices are telling you to do things, are you finding yourself driving in the middle of the night with a shovel and a knife and, uh, and waking <laughs> up with, with muddy shoes and bloody hands and stuff? Do you, like, kind of go, wow, when did that happen? No comment. <laughs> you won't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> It says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> actually, I, it, it's very exciting when that happens. It, it's actually very exciting. It's maybe the most fun part of writing, when something you might kind of take over. What, finding a bloody shovel? <laughs> finding a... I mean, not, not the driving in the middle of the night, the muddy <laughs> Okay, good. But, but yeah. the other part is, but when, when, um, when your writing starts to take over, that's the fun part, and then it just goes. The story almost writes itself. Oh, okay, so so, but when we when we change that to the other side, so you've got, we were talking a lot about uh, your characters and stuff, and how sometimes you're in charge and different things happen, and and the story comes together. How is it that you get into the mind of the 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 killer, the bad person, or bad people? Let's say if there are more than one in the book and how do you act that out like how do you make it because you have to get right into a character if they're a prominent character i find in order to make them real like you have to fill out all the details in that character you you make people believe that this person is the killer you know so how does that happen for you yeah i think that really gets into the heart of the writing process for people who write crime fiction, it is the central question, how do you pull something like that off? And my villains, my bad guys, my murderers, I, I don't have serial murderers. In other words, I don't have someone with a particular psychopathy or anything like that. Um, so... I have an amateur sleuth who is an ordinary person for all of her rather extraordinary um, profession and accomplishments. I want to say that I also have an amateur criminal, and I almost treat that character in the same way as I do my protagonist, because you have to narrow. I, I'm going to take it from the other end for a minute for the amateur sleuth, None of us are getting involved in a murder investigation. We're calling the police and calling it a day. There has to be something that drives an ordinary person to embark upon this kind of investigation. And I just figured out for myself, and it will be different for other writers, the options that she has, the choices that she has in her life, that I have to narrow those to the point where something that would have been impossible for her or us in chapter one becomes the only way forward by chapter five or ten. It's the same thing for the criminal. This is an ordinary person who has found his or her choices so limited that the only way forward is to 
commit a terrible crime. The, both ends of those, to me, have to be believable. Where the criminal is concerned, and this maybe is the case in real life as well, on some level, a lack of imagination, cannot see another way forward or just feels so threatened. So my amateur sleuth feels so threatened or is in a position with so few options open to her that she must go forward and be brave in a way that she doesn't think she can do. And it's the same thing on the other side for the bad, the criminal, the villain, something that he or she would not imagine doing ends up for this person to appear to be the only way forward. So it is, I think it's a great question and it is absolutely, um, I think whether or not it's important for the writers and I think whether or not, the, I think the readers sense that as well, that they will get it and they will accept it if it's framed in that way. So basically you just go and, uh, Go out and kill people for yourself to find out how to do it. Um, I don't think that this is something. I think this is something we can discuss later. Um, I'm not saying there would be any money involved or any money would change hands in order to facilitate this conversation, but it could happen. So um, we may have to have that chat after the show. And you're, where can I reach you? Yeah. <laughs> one eight hundred. One eight hundred. Uh, call. Yeah. Where do you see yourself going with this series? Like, how many more books, and and how much further do you think you'll go um, with something like this? Yes. Well, I'm under contract for three more books in this series, and I think I'm going to about. I originally signed a contract only for three books, and now there are going to be three more. So I will have to, I do have an end in sight whenever it happens. In other words, how I want to conclude the series. I'm just not sure when that's going to be. Um, we weren't ready to say goodbye to this character or this series after three books. And I'm really happy about that. But I have a totally different kind of book in mind. And I'm kind of itching to write it. You can always come back. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, obviously, I'm going to do the three more books and, you know, possibly continue. I do have another series that's going to be coming out in about six months, and there are three books in that series. But somehow in between, I got the uh, I got the itch to write a thriller. I think there's some creams for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I decided to start small with a flash fiction story. And um, it's going to be published in um, in the easy women's women on writing, and it, the whole idea for the story has just kind of grabs me. And so I think in my spare time, in my off time, I'm going to scratch out something a little bit grittier than where I've been so far. I also came back. I had I went to BatcherCon is you know the crime fiction conference the year of crime fiction conference and it's very heavy on thrillers a lot of um, a lot of thrillers and i was on a panel with five other hardcore thriller writers and i read all of their books and that might have been it for me i'm going to going to go might go a little more hardcore for um for uh, for uh, it would be a standalone novel oh yeah yeah cuz you could you could have um the story would be about going to the uh, festival and you slowly killing off the competition authors. We talked about that all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the funny part of it is, and I know people have said this before, the people in the crime fiction community are the most, not just wonderful, intelligent, interesting people, of course, but they are so kind. I am a member, well, of... Mystery Writers of America, but also New York sister, uh, Sisters in Crime, and I belong to the New York chapter. And I just remember walking in for the first day. I was not a published writer. I didn't have a book, an agent. I had nothing. It was probably the best thing I've ever done for myself. Uh, it is a really great community and somewhat interesting that people who write about murder for a living in their real lives are just incredibly kind and helpful and 
we'll give you all kinds of resources. So, uh, but yes, we spent the entire weekend talking about how if we set the story at the conference, we could kill off who we kill off and how we go about doing it. Oh yeah. 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 Or you could just sleep your way to the top. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. I've never wanted to say no comment so often in my life. <laughs> I've detected that as a killer multiple times over. Yeah, I'll that's have, the, uh, that's I'll the be some explaining show. to do. You're uh, on the no comment. <laughs> <laughs> no that's comment so show. Yes. I take the fifth. Okay, so what's your process? How do you how do, you do this in the sense of... Um, do you, uh, are you, can you sit and schedule time and do it and turn it on and just write when you've got the time? Or do you have to be in a certain mood uh, to put together your stories? No, I don't get into a mood. I just sit down and write every day. And I am absolutely fine with writing something that is total garbage. I just, I, I, I sit down and I write... I have sort of a minimum word count that I want to do each day. Just I don't really like to leave my desk unless I've written a thousand words a day. Now they may be one thousand of the worst words ever committed to a word document, but I, I do that every day. So the writing part for me, I mean, I, um, it is what I do now full time, and I, I, I've heard people say they treat it like a job. I don't think I treat it like a job. It's just kind of what I do. I, I, I very rarely do I not write, or at least sit down and think about something that I'm going to write. That's the part that I like. There are other parts of writing that I'm not so crazy about, but I am. Um, Name names. <laughs> <laughs> I don't love, even though I am having a fantastic time this afternoon, um, like PR stuff. Um, I hate to say it, but that is really my strong suit. So those are the things that are more difficult for me. I I do them. I will do all the blog tours and all of that kind of stuff, but it isn't my favorite kind of writing, and I find myself doing quite a lot of that kind of writing. This is actually easy for me to just sit down and talk, but writing the answers to 10 interview questions that are going to go on a blog and then having to write 10 completely different answers to the same questions that someone else will be posting, that is not my favorite kind of writing. I do it, but I, I will... I have to admit that I don't love it, and I apologize to every blogger I've ever appeared. Oh, media are <laughs> awful people. Media are disgusting. <laughs> nothing good about any well, of them. Well, I've heard right. podcasting is really oh, the, the it's, it's even worse than this. This is radio. <laughs> <laughs> How was the pandemic for you? in writing then so it, you had no problems writing right through pandemic and stress and everything can be going on outside your house and it doesn't seem to bother you no i mean the pandemic didn't really change that much in terms of my daily routine i do like to go to performances i miss that obviously the social aspect was uh dreadful but the greater part of my day sitting down at the desk where I'm sitting right now, that didn't change. My sister um, moved in with us during the pandemic, and she moved in for two weeks. She ended up staying six months. And so it was almost like we had, we had, we were all working. So my husband, my sister and I, and we kind of went off into our separate mental spaces and desks and then met for drinks afterwards. So the pandemic on that level was fine. I just, um, in terms of my writing, it was, I think, an emotional toll that I don't think any of us have reckoned with yet. I cannot, I think now, uh, there's a lot of second guessing about how we handled the pandemic. And I just keep thinking of, um, I hope 
Well, I'm just going to say it. Of the refrigerated tents and trucks that were outside all of the New York City hospitals. And I feel like maybe we've forgotten about that. It was that bad. So there was this terrible sense of dread and, but for me, I escaped into my writing. I know that for a lot of people, not only could they not write, I had a lot of people tell me they were having problems reading, that they could only read short things because they were so oppressed by what was going on in the world. I was kind of the opposite. I, I read a ton and, um, and I escaped both into reading and writing. So it, it didn't affect me on a professional level, but on a personal level, like everyone else, it was, um, was a tough time. Right, right. Now, when when someone um, goes out and buys your book, and they take it home and they read it, at the end of the book, besides the murder, the mystery, and, and some of the characterizations that you have put in the book, what is it you, you want them to take away from it? And and is there like a um, a meaning or a subtext or some sort of a, a point that lies underneath the story. There is. And again, it, you know, this question in many ways circles around one to one of the earlier ones that you asked me about my character. She has to learn that there's more to life and more to her than being on stage. And that is something we could all think about. Um, you just asked me about the pandemic. Well, a lot of people had to find out, had to become or understand that there was something more to them. People lost their jobs. They lost their homes. What is it about me? But they didn't lose their value as human beings. There's there's more to us than being on stage. We have more value than that. And this is something that my character has to come to terms with because people are constantly judging her. And that's her job. Um but there is more to her and I and and I'd like my readers to think about that as well. I taught English for many years, and I would tell my students this all the time. I mean, now kids, from the first day of high school, your entire um, high school career is caught up in getting together your resume for things that you did. And maybe high school is not just about that. It's also about finding out who you are. So that's my very... Um, Kind of, I, as you said, maybe just the underlying theme or feeling, um, but also a trajectory for the character that amplifies over the course of the books. Now, do you like to interact with a, a lot of readers and fans, and, and do you have like a social media accounts and platforms and website and all that? How, how do you want people to uh, get a hold of you? Uh, well, I'll tell you what I have. I have a Linktree account that's uh, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E. -E. And so if you look for Laurie Robbins Mysteries there, I've just found that it's the most convenient thing. So I don't have to tell readers how they would like to interact with me because every way to contact me is right there. The only thing I will say is I have failed uh, multiple times at Twitter. So if you contact me, if you DM me on Twitter, uh, I'll try. But Instagram, Facebook, I have a website. All of the, all of my contact links are in my Linktree account, which it has been great because readers will get in touch with me on whatever platform they're comfortable with. And, and I love that. So. That is your one-stop shop for Lori Robbins Mysteries. Wow, there you go. So we'll have that up and, and everything uh, ready to go for people so listeners can find you quickly. Thank you. You know, they might they might Thanks. need to get a hold of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, after this show, I may have to go into the witness protection program. <laughs> what are you trying to say? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to say Lori who? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, you can just that's tell a wrong that. number. That's, no, that's some writer's name. That's not a real name. That's not, yeah. Well, so so what do you think, um, what's next for you now? You, like you're going to do these other couple of books you're working on and then 
and then see what happens? Yes. Um, I'm actually very excited about what's going on in the upcoming year, and I can't believe we're almost at the end of this one. So I am on an accelerated um, schedule for murder in fourth position, which will come out around June. The first book in my master class series, which is about a crime fighting English teacher who solves mysteries using clues from the books that she teaches her class. It's actually a lot of fun and it's a puzzle. So all us mystery people love puzzles. That will be re-released in May. I am, as you know, tinkering with this thriller and talk about evil twins. Don't want to give away too much, but that will hopefully, that will hopefully uh, take shape as well. So uh, I'll keep you posted about that one. Yeah, that's interesting. Anybody you'd want to work with? You mean in terms of... Not ballerina, I'm thinking writing. In terms of writing, you mean like a writing mentor? Yeah, or is there there any writers out there that you'd go, wow, I'd love to write with that person, like you've read their book and you kind of go, wow, that's great. Yes, there is. Um, I don't know that she's super popular. Um, She publishes in the U.K., um, her name is Judith Flanders, and she's just an excellent writer. And she she's also um, she's written some wonderful mysteries that take place in a publishing company in London. And she is someone who I would just love to work with. She's funny and smart, and her books are great. I should ask just to make sure. Now the books they stand alone. You don't have to have one before the other. I mean, it's probably preferable because you learn about the character and as they go through their, you know, what goes on in book one to book two and stuff like that. But they do stand on their own, right? Absolutely. You can pick up any of the books and um, they are all written to be read as a standalone novel. When you complete a book like that, what do you, for you, what's it do for you? I'm a nervous wreck. (laughs) (laughs) So what are you nervous about? Like you're nervous about reaction? I don't know. You're nervous about getting things right or? Well, yes, you know, your name is on it. You've put your whole heart and soul into something. And then someone says, well, I don't know why you had to make these characters so mean to each other. So I am always anxious. I would like to be oh very much high above all of that but the truth of the matter is i'm a nervous wreck and i hope people will like the book and that i can continue to write and do something that i love other than that i have uh, i have a stand of all of my books and i also have several short stories in in anthologies and I have them all lined up, and that feels pretty good. What, do, you, do you ever need a break from writing? Like when you're writing a, a darker sort of write book, um, murder and stuff like that, do you ever need to take a break? or? I'm, tr- I'm working on that. It's one of my New Year's resolutions to step away a little bit more. I'm not – I get very caught up in what I'm doing, and – Part of that is good because I'm very concentrated. So if I'm writing, I'm just writing. Um, but then the other part of it is I'm a terrible multitasker. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put myself on more of a schedule, more of stepping away. I mean, I do have a life away from writing. Um, I still take ballet class. I still, I, I see people. I feel like I'm trying to convince you that I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, uh, we've we got the ambulance on its way. <laughs> I, no, that's the answer. I don't feel like I need to get away from it, uh, or I don't want to get away from it, but sometimes I need to get away from it, yes. Wow. So no, but also yes. Well, you were talking about uh, writing short fiction. Do you, do you um, prefer writing uh, novels or short stories? Do you... Do you consider yourself more of a natural uh, novelist or a natural short story writer? Without a doubt, novelist. I was quite intimidated at the thought of writing a short story, and I couldn't even make myself try for quite a long time. I was at a writing conference where I went to a couple of different uh, panels and workshops, and I just decided I would try. 
And I found it a very different kind of experience. What I decided to do, um, and that I have done so far in two short stories, is that I would use that as an experiment, that I had one way of writing or, well, really two different series, but that I would get, I would almost like I want to try another genre, and it seemed low stakes to me. It's not that easy to write a short story. (laughs) I think people think, well, it's easier because it's shorter, but it's more like poetry. If one word doesn't belong there, it's garbage. Whereas I'm more at home in novels. I, I like the, I like the, I like taking, I like the time. Mm, And I prefer reading novels as well. But I, I love some short stories. And, um, but I am, I don't think I'm a quote natural short story writer. It's something, it's a, it's a different kind of craft. Yeah. And I admire writers who are equally adept. Well, on that word, it's been a great conversation. Glad you came along and, uh, wish you nothing but the best and, uh, good luck, you know, with everything. Um, of course, the book, the new book out is Murder in the Third Position. It's an, on point mystery and it's written by laurie robbins and uh go out and buy it thank you so much for hosting me on the show this has been a lot of fun and i really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you guys thanks Laurie. you've been listening to the house of mystery radio show to find out more about our guests hosts all shows go to www.houseofmystery.com Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.